welcome back to this week's edition of the podcast. Um, and for the last three weeks, we've been going um, on a deep dive into really earth energy, our connection to earth energy and how that how the they are intertwined and what that means for us in terms of manifestation, uh, building the life that we want and subtle influences within our lives that we may not be aware of. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, in the first episode, I talked about the link between the energy of place and prosperity and abundance. Now, I briefly spoke about it. This is not something that the law of attraction or any of the manifestation gurus really want you to know, is that there are certain places in the earth which have what is known as a higher paramagnetic charge, and those areas tend to be more wealthy, more stable, people are healthier, people are happier. So actually where you live, your environment is far more important than just surrounding yourself with the right people and decluttering your home. It actually is in certain areas, you are better placed to make a better job of your life, earn more money. Um, and in other areas, you can be doing all the manifestation techniques, you can be journaling, visioning and taking all the action You've got to take the action as well, but it's still not coming. It's still not coming to fruition. And this is generally that there is a, a low paramagnetic charge in the soil where you live. That in turn has a knock on effect on your ability to retain um, an electrostatic charge. This affects your neurochemistry, it affects your hormones. So you're never really firing on all cylinders and you don't really know that. Um, so this is the link between prosperity and place. This, I think, is the fundamental principles that underpin a lot of geomancy work, including Feng Shui. Um, but I think a lot of this has got lost in translation in modern Feng Shui. So I think the paramagnetic and diamagnetic powers that I spoke about are what would be the yin and the yang energy. And this is why it's really important to have that balance, because they both need each other to form this sort of homeostasis. So that was in episode one. So I talked about the link between actually where you live and your ability to create a healthy, prosperous and abundant life, whatever that means to you. That might mean plenty of money. It might mean plenty of opportunities. It might mean freedom. It might mean, you know, but that you're giving value in your life and you're, you feel like you're contributing positively and you're able to go out and do the things that you want to do. Now, in episode two, I spoke more in depth about your pineal gland and conscious uh, quantum manifestation. Our brain really has... Um, synapses in it that really link to the quantum fields it's it's that point where science and magic meet and what that means is that it's actual earth energy and light that triggers neurochemistry in our brain that enables us to have go into altered states of awareness and expanded consciousness so it is not something we can do by ourselves um, it is something that we need the stimulus of the earth to do now, we either use things like um, we take ayahuasca or magic mushrooms or some of, some of chemical that enables us to do it, or we visit sacred sites. Now, sacred sites enable us to, or rather are there because they enhance our neurochemistry because of the nature of the electrostatic part within those um, areas. So in this part, in point th part three, I wanna look at that a little bit in more. So normally in the earth, there's kind of like a base level of electromagnetic charges. I mean, there are the EMFs of the earth. These are the electromagnetic frequencies. And there are many, many. There are an abundance of them. Most people are familiar with the, the Schumann resonance. Now, that's just one resonance. And it's roughly speaking equivalent to um, beta waves in the human brain. So that our brain and the earth sort of resonate in harmony because we have evolved to live on the earth over millennia. So that's one of the resonance, but there are many, many electromagnetic fields that go surface to the surface of the earth, and they sort of wave across the surface of the earth. This is very, you know, primary school explanation. This is now what happens at certain places of the earth, haven't we? We've got fault lines. There can be major fault lines that we will know about, things like the San Andreas Fault. Um, but there are also minor fault lines everywhere. I live in a town that has a minor fault line running through its central bit in a small valley, right through our public park next to our medieval castle. And that's a minor fault line. Um, and actually, there are Neolithic mounds on that fault line. I have there's a Neolithic mound in my small um, park up the road in the in the main in the main part of the town. So why this is the thing that sacred sites 
in most places around the world, but particularly, you know, I know the UK very well, stone circles, chamber cairns, all those things are located very near to geological fault lines. Now, why is this? This is because the EMF frequency, the electromagnetic GMFs, the geomagnetic frequency um, of the sort of earth currents in those areas spikes, if you like. Now, it's this difference in area, in these spikes of energy that the brain notices and triggers it um, to produce these particular neurochemicals. Um, and again, if we visit these sites, um, late in the evening or early morning, it's when the light spectrum is changing, particularly when it's changing from blue green in the day to red orange at night. So it's when we make these shifts, it's this change of daylight spectrum into evening spectrum. This is what induces the brain, as I spoke of in the first episode, to in, um, it increases our melatonin production. We reach a certain saturation point in melatonin production, this triggers our brain to produce another chemical, neurochemical called pinaline. And basically then the two link together and they form DMT. And this is our, the chemical that makes us dream. So this is a class A hallucinogen. And it's, we have an animal-based form of that naturally occurring within our body. But when we take things like um, ayahuasca, that is a plant-based form of DMT. So we take ayahuasca, we go to the shaman in the rainforest, we take ayahuasca, and we have this um, out-of-body experience where we're running as a jaguar or we're doing whatever the ayahuasca trip enables us to do, but we are awake when we do it. As opposed to at night, when no all this normally occurs, we are asleep. But well, what sacred sites in these particular formations do, they enable us to have this dream state while we are awake. Now, I used to go to a lot of sacred sites as a kid because um, I lived in Ireland, very rural Ireland where there are a lot of these sites everywhere. So, you know, you could throw a stick and it would land in a hill fort. And um, very near to that, there was often a standing stone. There were a whole field of just unmarked barrows that I used to cycle past and we used to climb on them as children. Some that still had the entrances visible, but they were just sort of caving in. So they were everywhere. And as a child, because I could see energy and I still can, I used to look at these sites and think, well, there's a lot going on there, particularly at certain times. So I spend a lot of times at key festivals, key dates, um, visiting these sites in the evening and having the most amazing out of body experience and seeing energy in a whole new way. So for instance, at certain moon phases, certain energy lines, these sites will link up. There's like beams of energy that go from one mound to the next in the nearest vicinity, if it's still there. A lot of this network is broken, unfortunately, because a lot of these places have been um, destroyed through um, either religious activity or they've been farmed out. Um, but we have these, at these sites, you get this buildup of energy at certain times. And it's not the same at every single site. So the, the key is the alignment that you'll have, you know, is it aligned to midwinter, midsummer? Has the area got a particular name? Like where I used to live in Ireland, there was a hill called Crook Beltane. Um, Beltane in Irish Gaelic is the name for the, month, the whole of May. It's, it's this phase of energy. But Beltane is obviously um, May Day. It's, this, um, it's one of the eight festivals in the Celtic wheel. Um, and it's you know, one, of these, um, one of the key points where the energy changes. So what I notice is that particular sites at particular times, you get this buildup of energy. Um, and what it, what it appears to be, um, and it, well, it appears in many different forms. Let me get this right to start with. So at certain sites, you will have um, huge columns of energy that rise out of the site straight up into the sky, and it gives off this vibration noise. And every so often, you'll at certain sites, but not all of them, you'll get this large toroid. It looks like a donut of energy, and it will occasionally go boom, boom, up this column of energy with this pulsing every so many seconds. I used to watch these for hours as a children. It was like smoke rings going up this column. And when, of course, recently they discovered the Bosnian pyramids and they're measuring these pulses out the top and this constant static charge, and then there's this bump, bump, they're also measuring, these are scientists measuring this. I looked at the pyramid and I thought, well, you're actually measuring this column of light and you're measuring the toroids going up because I can see them. So it's really interesting. I must contact them actually and let them know. Um, they'll probably think I'm a nutter, but there you go. <laughs> 
So, and at other areas next to sacred sites, what you also get is out of the fault line, and we get that here in the town where I've lived, I've watched it many, many times, you'll get um, a, like a wave of energy. Now over the ground itself, about so far above the ground, there is this little like filigree of energy. It uh, looks like a, almost like a spider's web that covers the whole of the earth. And when we walk through it, it breaks little dust patterns and then it comes back and settles back down again. But we, you know, you can see it. Now, when, a fault, when we're near a fault line, again, at certain times when this fault line is activated or some kind of movement, this energy rises up like a wave, literally like a small tsunami, and it moves across the ground. But behind it, it kind of like draws all this, it's like white, like fog. To me, that's what it looks like. And I've since come to realize that that's probably plasma. And this wave will go along the ground, out of the fault line, just a bit faster than walking speed and only so far above the ground. So it's like this white tsunami that goes across the ground. Now, I think that ancient man was trying to capture this energy because this, when this energy occurs, what we often get at these sites is ditches and banks um, formations um, with entrances. And what happens because this energy moves and can only go so far, if you dig a big ditch in its path, it actually flops like water into this ditch and fills up. But if the bank is so high, it can't get over it. So what you end up is these reserves of this like plasma energy in these rings. Now, what that does is it seems to highly charge the, the area within the, the ditch and bank end. Everything within that then becomes, you know, it, the, the air, in fact, the quality of the air, the, the, the colors and the patterns in the air change within that. Um, and it sort of like enhances everything when you're in it. It's sort of like, you know, superhuman status. You, you are the best that you can be. And if you put any animals through it, you know, their health is improved, our health is improved, fertility is improved. Um, we also get different formations at different sites that do similar things. So for instance, at Chambered Cairns, um, like we might be familiar with Wayland Smithy or West Kennet Longbar or any of these, um, Newgrange, Dow, there, there are energy lines coming in through the entrance and they've often got chambers at the side. And these energy lines split off because they're in segments, they're in like multiple bands within an energy line. And the end was a spit off and they will curl into these side chambers and earth back down into the ground. And traditionally, that's where we have found archaeologically remains of seed and things that were put or exposed in these chambers for a while. Um, and I've now reconstructed some of these um, things. I've reconstructed things like um, stone circles, um, with um, ditch and bank structures, and rather than putting stone circles in, I've used other material that replicate that to capture this plasma energy. I've built stone ch miniature chamber cairns and exposed seas to them. And what happens is it's not just our health and vitality that is improved, it's the health and vitality of the area. And if we expose seed in these areas, for instance, the seed germinates quicker, it grows more uniformly, it's more disease and pest resistant, it crops earlier, it has a more abundant cropping season, it has a shorter cropping season. So this is really, you're enhancing your way of living, but at the same time, it's not just the physical benefits of health and vitality. For us particularly, there are sort of capabilities and spiritual benefits is that we become more attuned to our environment. We unlock parts of ourselves that we didn't know we had because of this um, enhancement in our body when we are it's when we put ourselves in these um, sacred spaces. A lot of sacred spaces, you know, it, the type of sacred structure that you get, whether it be a stone circle um, with a ditch, ditch and henge structure, you know, ditch and, ditch and bank structure around the henge, or you've got a chambered cairn, or you've got a stone row, or you've got whatever it may be, a standing stone. There are different subtle energy phenomena that crop up in different formations, and that really dictates the type of structure that you're going to build. So there was definitely a technology to this. It connects to sound waves because some of these energy lines appear to be created by subaudial noise, I would call it. It's noise below our hearing range that we can measure as sound, and then these sound waves come up and create lines. There are other lines that are sort of tubular that go across the ground, 
Um, some of them rise vertically and they have these toroid ring structures uh, flowing up them. You also get temporary structure that look almost like a solid line doing a 3D Rubik's cube thing. Um, they crop up at certain areas at certain times and seem to be connected to planetary movements. But it's the plasma that really gets me. When I was a child, I used to notice that, you know, like for instance, at full moons, if you've got a collection of mounds within a certain distance, their energy is able to connect. If you break that link and you plow out, you know, let's say you've got a group of mounds here and a group of mounds here and a group of mounds here across a geographical distance. Now that one is able to speak to that one is able to speak to that one. So it means they can all connect. But if we um, then get involved more in agriculture and land closure and, you know, modern agriculture as it, as it sort of began, and we scrub this out, those two are too far away to connect. But in Ireland, there's a lot of untouched places. So these lines still connect. And at certain periods, you'll get energy lines will hoop out of this one, hoop to the next one, and it hoops out of this one and hoops to the last one. And along this, you get these huge lines of plasma flowing through the landscape. They can appear as earth lights along these lines um, because these sites retain this high um, electrostatic charge. And then this plasma, I say, it gets drawn in or created, I'm not quite sure which yet, but I suspect it's sort of drawing because plasma is everywhere in the universe, draws in this, con this sort of condensed plasma and we see it as, uh, as earth lights. But this plasma is also conscious, so it responds to us. So in ancient times, people would often say along these lines of energy, the, the legends of the fairy, for instance, they would see lots of little fairy people walking across. Now, I think people dismiss the fairy faith because they think, oh, how incredibly naive to think about little fairies with little things sticking across. But it's not that. What it, what it is, because and the fairy faith was common throughout the whole world. So every culture had belief about nature spirits, which is both consciousness is nature. And in quantum physics, you know, we know everything is conscious. So, you know, Rupert Sheldrake wrote a paper about is the sun conscious? And you might say you can't prove it's conscious. And his argument is, well, you can't prove it isn't. And in terms of the quantum universe, if we recognize that the, that the universe it's not does the universe have consciousness within it, it's that the universe is consciousness itself, then every part of the universe must be conscious in its own way. Not saying conscious like humans are, but has its own consciousness. So the earth has its own consciousness, nature has their own consciousness. Now we try and put an imagery on that that makes it understandable to us. So we have little images of fairies, pixies, elves, the old man of the ant mound, whatever country you come from, they have all these legends. And the plasma response seems to respond to our imagery. So in ancient times at these sites, people would go there, they would you know, slip out of time for a while, they would go and cavort with the fairies and come back and nine years had passed and they were the same. They're going to have been away with the fairies. In modern times, that was the equivalent to people seeing UFOs. They saw aliens. They would slip out of time because you can slip out of time very easily when these places are activated. Disappear, you know, go and have a probe stuck up their ass or something with an alien spaceship and they'd come back and go, oh, I've been captured by aliens. It's like going into other space. So when we think about dimensions, I think this is the thing. From my personal experience, I would say all dimensions exist simultaneously. There is sort of, I wouldn't say there are lots of different dimensions. Um, it's just that there is this huge spectrum of existence. And our wavelength, our human experience wavelength is quite a narrow perspective. The same as we can only see certain colors. We can't see ultraviolet and we can't see infrared. We cannot hear dog whistles. We, there's lots of noises in nature that are beyond our spectrum of hearing. And I think there are lots of phenomena that are normally beyond our spectrum of feeling or other form of senses. And our sixth sense and our seventh sense are ones that enable us to connect to these, but that we're not, they're not on by default in human beings normally. It's something that we have to cultivate. So when we go into these areas where they're highly active, particularly when there seems to be a lot of plasma about, and this is what I've noticed really just like when you get this highly charged plasma energy, it makes it much more easier for people to obtain these extended, um, expanded awareness and sort of slip out of their own head. Now, this is something that I've always been able to do as a child because I've mentioned this before and I'm not saying I'm special or anything, but I don't have any alpha waves. So the normal state of relaxation that people get to go into when they're meditating and all the rest of it, I don't have that. I go straight from normal awake 
into like dream state. <laughs> and actually I can create dream state while I'm awake. So this is something I used to do a lot of as a child. My, my school reports are full of she was daydreaming and it's like, I can be awake and dreaming at the same time. Now it's not a split screen or anything like that. It's that I'm having two simultaneously, full 360 experiences um, simultaneously. I can't describe it any better than that. People say, was oh, it like split screen? No, what I can see here in my day-to-day -day vision is just as real as the other thing because sight is not just in your eyes, if you like. Sight is in your mind, which is in these extended energy fields. So I used to go to these sites as a kid, particularly to have ex um, step out of body, astrally project, go into other times, go into other sort of spaces in this whole spectrum of existence that was beyond the sort of narrow human spectrum of life. And I think ancient man was far more aware of the presence of plasma. Maybe he could see like I do, um, and these charges. And when you, when you realize what, you know, how, when you can see a lot of these things, then for instance, like um, the triple spiral carvings at Newgrange or cup and ring marks, you kind of look at them and think, well, we're looking at them flat on a rock, but what you really need to do is 3D them and then they make a lot more sense. Um, so I'm not really, if I'm brutally honest, I've not really spoken in depth about a lot of this. Course. This podcast was called like sort of um, to introduce people to some of these concepts um, and, and these ideas. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because I think there is a whole technology here that we need to start utilizing for the betterment of mankind. If we can recreate these energies and harness this plasma and harness this energy, isn't that much better for the landscape than using herbicides and pesticides and agrochemicals? Because I know when I've recreated these on smaller scales of work with farms, the use of agrochemicals and irrigation, for instance, goes way down. And a friend of my, Dr. Pascal Manaway, is, is still doing this work today. Um, I kind of moved away from it, but I'm thinking I need, I'm really feeling the call to move back to it. I think that would be much better for us than modern life. So as well, using these spaces for our own benefit. It's not just sitting there and we want to feel people go into these spaces, oh God, I feel so much calmer now. Oh, isn't that lovely? And then go back to your same shitty lifestyle. It's that, <laughs> I don't mean everybody's got a shitty lifestyle, but you know what I mean? This fast paced hustle culture that tells us we must do this and you've got to get a job and you must do this. And it's all this like false edifice all the time. It's not real. Now I'm not saying we need to go back to being a hunter gatherer, or, you know, and, you know, using a spear to bring down the farmer's pigs or anything like that and learning how to make shoes out of leather again. You know, I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that there must be a more modern application for this very ancient technology. And I know probably there are people working on plasma as we speak and all the rest of it. I don't doubt that for a minute. But I think with very simple tweaks, we can, um, you know, bring this energy into our own homes. We can bring this energy into our own lives. It doesn't actually take that much. Now, I know not everybody lives next to a sacred site, but by studying the variations in sacred sites and what makes them different from other areas, what that led me to look at was well, what's happening in areas where there are no fault lines, where there are not huge amounts of energy lays? Why were we so intent on harnessing these big areas? Now, what's with you when you look at these ancient sites? You know, we're now finding them through lidar everywhere. We realise how many are missing. What happens if you build a sacred site? It has a certain geographical radius of influence. Now, if you build another one within a certain mass those two manage to link up and they expand their area of influence. So what might have been, you know, might have been five miles, if you put another one, I don't know, 20 miles away, by how quite how they do it, extends their area of influence so that they each expand their radius 10 miles, they link up, they talk, you get this plasma go from one to the other that I spoke about. If these sites still existed, particularly in the UK, for instance, the whole of the UK's energy would be enhanced because they heighten everything within a certain radius. So by removing them, 
and by, you know, Stukely breaking up stone circles, you know, gradually over history, you know, I don't know, Romans, Celts, everybody else who's pillaged these stones um, and broken and plowed them out and all the rest of it. We've broken up a large nationwide network of um, earth energy that creates a high electrostatic charge and pushes this highly charged plasma all over, all over the landscape, is my theory. Please feel free to argue with me about that. Um, but I suspect looking at work, um, people like Andrew Collins looking at plasma and things like that at the moment. So it's down these plasma lines, other forms of consciousnesses that we traditionally have seen, I don't know, as fairies. Some people see them as aliens. Well, it's like that other forms of consciousness, non-human or the more than human forms of consciousness travel up and down this entire spectrum. So we are we are one side of the barrier of reality because we're choosing to have a physical experience with quite a narrow bandwidth of perception. But if you go the other side of the barrier, which is where I go when I go out of body, you can go up and down all over the place. It's like getting on a tube and you can get off in any kind of experience that you actually like. So I think if we recognize what that this energy and this these these forms had multiple functions, they, they enhanced the paramagnetism of the soil that made all life fauna, flora, um, healthier, happier, more productive, you know, better birthing rates, healthier offspring, including our own. But it also enhances our ability to have extrasensory perception, expanded awareness, altered states of consciousness. So we could plug into that other side of reality, that non-physical side where we could connect to all the other consciousnesses that actually exist in the subtle energy realm that contribute to the entire experience of living and the universe. And it means we get out of our human centric perception of what reality is because people have an incredibly human centric perception of the universe. It places humans at the center of it and everything else revolving around you. I personally was never brought up like that. You know, to me, um, you know, plants and animals, and we're all equal and we don't have dominance over any, anything. So, you know, um, you know, when I garden, I always let plants know when I'm going to cut them. I let them know the day before. I've got to come out and cut some branches off you, Shabri. I'm really sorry. I'm going to be doing it tomorrow. Let it know so that the spirit of the plant is aware of it, can make adjustments to the energy field. And then we go out the next day, it has. You can see the energy's been withdrawn and that branch knows it's going to be cut off. So, and this is unfortunate in that I see energy everywhere. And I would say that particular, this when it comes to particular sacred sites as well, they all have their own different energy. And some of them have very different influence and impacts on the human energy field. Um, some sites seem to be concerned with particular areas of the body, which makes me wonder whether they're also concerned with um, disease eradication. Uh, and the sound resonance that comes from some of them, again, resonance with particular organs of the body. Um, and as these things were being built, often where we were going from hunter gathering to farmer settlers, it does make me wonder whether that we realised that our state of health at that point in time was already starting to deteriorate compared to what it had been. So we were trying to, with becoming farmer settlers, and manipulating our landscape and moving rocks and plowing the ground and doing things we recognized through that action that we were disturbing these natural flows of energy. So we built sacred sites to restore the balance and harmony. And since then, we have eradicated a lot of these sacred sites. So we have interrupted the balance of harmony. And I think we are seeing the result of that in most and a lot of people's health and well-being and just the general way that society is progressing um, don't mistake ch or changing don't mistake change for progress there is a lot of stuff in the modern world that breaks our heart and soul um, and i think you know for me personally i would love to work more with this energy do more experiments with this energy and teach more people about this energy so i will be doing more courses back on this some new stuff some experimental stuff so if you'd like to learn more about it, you know, click like, click subscribe, um, you know, send me a message. Um, I won't say sign up for my freebie, um, but if you want to know more about it, make sure you subscribe and all that kind of thing and, and stay informed. So, um, yeah, this is this is really where I want to go with things. So, um, yeah. And this energy is great because I said 
Fang Shui was the original, you know, one of the, it's one of the complete geomancy systems that we still got. But for me, it's a bit more, you know, it has to be really applied in depth. And it's not just, you know, Feng Shui for your home. You know, you can geomance your home. You know, you can geomance entire farms. You can geomance entire businesses, agricultural businesses. You can geomance non-physical businesses as well. Because at the end of the day, you're working on the energy, not the physical manifestation of it. So, you know, I think it, I think this stuff is really important. And I would love, love to hear your thoughts. So, um, yeah, Ho who's had experiences of sacred sites? What did you feel in them? Did you see anything? Did you hear anything? Did you have any out-of-body experiences? I was always really good at psychometry in sacred sites, so I could see the um, landscapes. I would have out-of-body experiences. I would, uh, in Ireland particularly, I met with many of the she, the Irish fairy, who imparted so much knowledge and information for, with me about how this all sits together. And this is something that I've followed throughout my life, but life, you know, gets in the way when you're adult, does it? You have to do all the normal stuff to get them that has to get married but I did you know have married children career um but I think now it's time to really dig deep on all this stuff so I will actually be writing a book about all the different forms of energy I can see them my experiences of them so I'm actually writing that now so um I can't wait for that to come out um so I'll let you know if you want to hear more about that let me know as well so I um have a great afternoon thank you very much for listening and I will see you all again very soon.